car shoppers around the world seem to be moving from traditional sedans into vehicles that are a little bit more practical, like compact crossovers, subcompact crossovers, and compact hatchbacks. And that's why in today's video, we're taking a look at the 2017 Chevrolet Cruze hatchback. The United States is getting a number of new hatchbacks in 2017 and in 2018. We have the all-new Civic hatchback, this all-new Chevy Cruze hatchback, and upcoming, the all-new Hyundai Elantra GT hatchback. Before we continue, you should know that Chevy is attacking the compact hatchback segment a little bit differently than other manufacturers, because this only comes in the top end trims of the Cruze. So it starts at $21,240, whereas the regular sedan starts under $17,000. That is, of course, before we take into account incentives, discounts, and of course deals, which you will find a little bit more often at the Chevy dealer than at the Honda or the Mazda dealer. However, the fact that this comes only in those top end trims is important to keep in mind if you're cross shopping this with some of the base models of the competition, because we do find features inside this cruise that we don't find in the base models, of the Mazda 3, the Honda Civic, etc. The sedan and the hatchback are styled very much alike. We have the corporate Chevy front end look, which reminds me an awful lot of the Camaro and the Chevy Malibu, with this strong crease that goes all the way through the front end of the vehicle, across the hood, and then down the car as well. All cruise models in the United States get halogen projector headlamps. You don't find LEDs or HIDs even in the top end premier trim that we're driving right here. You'll notice that lower on the front end, we don't have any fog lamps. That's likely because Chevy was very concerned with aerodynamics and fuel efficiency in the cruise. This is one of the most efficient vehicles in the compact sedan or compact hatchback segment. And that's before we even talk about the available diesel engine that we find under the hood. Cargo practicality is obviously one of the big reasons to buy the hatchback version of a vehicle over the sedan version of a vehicle. But the other reason to buy a compact hatch over a compact sedan is the overall length, because this is eight inches shorter than the sedan, making it easier to park in the city. At 175 inches long, the Cruze is right in the middle of the compact hatchback pack. Like most compact hatchbacks, the wheelbase, which is the distance between the front wheel and the back wheel, is the same as the sedan version. So the only place this vehicle shrinks is right back there behind the rear tires. Out back, we find halogen tail lamps that wrap from the body on over to the hatchback. We have parking sensors in our top end trim because, again, we are driving the Premier model. And then we have hidden exhaust tips below the rear bumper. When creating the Cruze, Chevrolet was obviously targeting fuel efficiency, and that's why we find an all-turbocharged engine lineup in America. Things start out with a 1.4-liter .4 four-cylinder turbocharged engine. That's what we're driving right here. This produces 153 horsepower and 177 pound-feet of torque. Power is sent to the front wheels via either a six-speed manual or a six-speed automatic transmission. Although the Cruze hatchback is supposed to score two miles per gallon lower than the Cruze sedan with the same engine and same transmission combination, we have been averaging well above the EPA score for this vehicle, as we'll talk about in the drive section. If 30 to 35 miles per gallon isn't enough for you, then Chevy would love to sell you their new 1.6 liter turbocharged diesel engine, which will be coming to America and you will find under this hood later in 2017. That engine produces 137 horsepower, which is a little bit below this 1.4 liter turbo, but produces much more torque at 240 pound feet. It's also mated to a standard six speed manual transmission, but if you choose the automatic transmission, then you get General Motors brand new nine speed automatic that we also find in the Chevy Malibu. The combination of that new nine speed auto and the diesel engine will give you 37 miles per gallon average according to the EPA and well over 50 miles per gallon on the highway. Front seat comfort comes in at seven out of 10 points for the compact sedan and compact hatchback category, primarily because we don't have adjustable lumbar support in this driver's seat. Base models of the Cruze will get a six-way manual adjustable driver's seat. We have the optional eight-way power adjustable seat, and we do have a tilt telescopic steering column with a large range of motion. When it comes to rear seat comfort, I'm gonna give this eight out of 10 points, keeping in mind that I'm six feet tall, my head does touch the ceiling if I try and sit upright in this rear seat. However, legroom is very generous in the Cruze. We have 78.1 inches of combined legroom, that's front row plus second row. That puts this towards the top of the segment and notably above something like a Ford Focus or the Volkswagen Golf. It's worth noting that the Volkswagen Golf wagon has exactly the same kind of legroom that we find in the regular Golf, all of the size increase actually happens back there in the cargo area. So if you're looking at the Volkswagen Golf Wagon, this is actually going to have more legroom than that vehicle. Moving all the way over to the right side of the vehicle, I have this front seat all the way back in its tracks. I had a six foot five person very comfortably sitting there and my knees are just barely touching the seat back. This situation is really where you'll notice the size increase versus the Focus or the Golf. Rear seat passengers get a softly padded center armrest with two cup holders and our model also has heated rear seats. The large legroom figure that we find in the Cruze allows us to safely put a rearward facing child seat behind a six foot tall passenger up front. 
Behind this hatch, we find 22.7 cubic feet of storage space versus 13.9 in the sedan. The size and shape of this cargo area allow us to put two of these 24-inch roller bags below this hard cargo cover, or three of the 24-inch roller bags if we take out that hard cargo cover and put them in this upright fashion. Folding the rear seat increases the cargo area to 47.2 cubic feet, which is roughly similar to the average subcompact crossover. If we take a peek under the cargo area load floor, we find a compact spare tire, which is becoming increasingly rare in this segment, and we find some additional storage space around the spare. When it comes to our exclusive trunk comfort index, I'm going to give this 7 out of 10 points. This cargo area is not quite as long as some of the compact hatchbacks in the United States that was obvious in our 24-inch roller bag test because we could not put them long ways right up here because they would hit the back of the seat and the hatch would not close. On the flip side, we do have that extra storage capacity under the cargo area load floor. We have a compact spare tire, which I appreciate, and a well-placed handle to help you close the hatchback. As we look around the interior, keep in mind we are in the top end premier trim. We have fixed height seat belts and two-way adjustable headrests. As we see in most compact vehicles, the front doors are made from a majority of hard touch plastics. So we have hard plastics lower here on the door right around this bottle holder, but we also have hard plastics up here on the window sill that may be a problem if you like to rest your arm there. We do, however, have a soft armrest right here and then a leatherette insert that wraps around that whole section. Moving from the doors to the dashboard, we find more of that stitched pleather in an insert right here in front of the passenger. The upper portion of the dashboard is a hard touch injection molded plastic that has then been after sprayed with a coating to make it feel a little bit softer and also help it deflect a little bit more of the light so it's not quite as shiny in your eyes on the windscreen. The glove compartment is a slot style compartment so the front drops down where you can put very small things like envelopes and then we have a deeper slot right in there where you can put a large number of items. In the center of the dashboard we find one of GM's latest 7 inch color touchscreen infotainment systems standard in all trims of the cruise hatchback. The system features a few physical buttons below the screen. We have a dedicated phone button, track forward, backward, power and volume, and a home button. The addition of CarPlay and Android Auto means that we essentially have navigation software available in every version of the cruise hatchback as long as you have an attached smartphone. It also means that we have a very well-designed media interface, again, as long as you're plugging that smartphone in. Of course, if you prefer, you can use the system's native interface to interact with your media device or your paired Bluetooth smartphone. And as we've come to expect from General Motors, the system also offers standard OnStar integration. Below the infotainment system, we find the single zone automatic climate control system, as well as the heated seat controls in our particular model. Below that, we find a small storage cubby. This is also where you'll find the USB and auxiliary input and a 12 volt charging port. Behind that, we have a fairly traditional console shifter drive and then low behind that. Once we're in the low mode, you can control how low you want to go with these plus and minus buttons on top of the shifter. To the right of that, we have two large cup holders. Continuing down the center console, we have our traction control off button, parking sensors enable disable button, and then we have a slot where you can stick your smartphone. My iPhone 7 Plus is just a little bit too large with that little rubber liner in there, but you can fit it in there without it. Between the front seats, we find a small padded armrest, which opens to reveal a moderately sized storage cubby where you can put wallets, keys, that sort of thing. The steering wheel is a three-spoke design. We have sport grips up top, and it's leather wrapped in the model that we're driving. On the left side of the wheel, we have the controls for the cruise control system, as well as a distance button for the forward collision alert system. We also have a heated steering wheel button and the button to enable and disable the lane departure warning and lane keeping assistance system. On the right side of the steering wheel, we have the buttons to control that multifunction display, a voice command button, and a phone hang up and pickup button. Thanks to the turbocharger on this 1.4 liter four cylinder engine, we ran from zero to 60 in 7.5 seconds. The small displacement turbocharged engine is also the key to the high fuel economy that we see in the Chevy Cruze. Now 7.5 seconds, zero to 60 is still slower than the Honda Civic because we don't find a continuously variable transmission under the hood. The CVT not only helps improve the fuel economy in the Civic, but it also helps improve the acceleration. Honda also produces more power out of their 1.5 liter turbo than this 1.4 liter turbo, and if you feed their hatchback premium gas in certain trims, it'll produce even more power. In our braking tests, we ran from 60 miles an hour back to zero in a very short 114 feet, which is very impressive for a vehicle in this segment. This is one of the shortest stopping distances for any compact sedan or compact hatchback. 
Interestingly enough, the stopping distance on this cruise hatchback is very short, even when you compare this to something like the brand new Honda Civic Sport hatchback, which has wide, very grippy tires. When it comes to handling, I'm going to give this a B plus. This is obviously not a Ford Focus RS or even a Honda Civic Sport hatchback, but this does very well for itself. In terms of actual road holding numbers, this actually grips the road a little bit better than a Mazda 3 in any form. Road holding is also superior in the cruise to most versions of the Ford Focus. Obviously, I'm not talking about the high performance versions of the Ford Focus, the ST or the RS, etc. I'm just talking about the regular run of the mill hatchbacks. The handling score really shouldn't be too surprising because the cruise is, of course, sold around the world, so this was targeted definitely at a worldwide audience, including Europe, where the cruise does fairly well for itself as far as market share. Although the cruise handles very well, this definitely feels different than a Mazda 3 or a Ford Focus out on the road because the suspension is a little bit softer, we get a little bit more body roll, and we get less feedback from the front tires. The trade-off for a little bit less road feel from the front tires is an improved ride, and I'm going to give this an A when it comes to the ride. This is a little bit softer than the Mazda 3 or the Ford Focus. You'll notice the difference not just out on rougher roads like we're on right here, but also out on the open highway, where this gives you a more compliant ride more suitable for long highway journeys than we find in something like that Mazda or the Ford or even some of the other compact hatchbacks we find on the market like the new Honda Civic hatchback. In our cabin noise test we scored 71 and a half decibels at 50 miles an hour making this one of the quietest compact hatchbacks on sale in America. As we see in many compact hatchbacks I do hear a little bit more road noise coming from the back of this vehicle versus the sedan version. That's because that cargo area is, of course, open to the passenger compartment. Keeping in mind that my daily commute involves going up and over a 2,200-foot mountain pass and, of course, winding mountain roads like we're driving on right here, we have been getting absolutely excellent fuel economy. We've been averaging between 33 and 36 miles per gallon overall this week with a final average of 35.2. That is notably above the EPA fuel economy score for the hatchback, but it's actually not too far off of the EPA EPA score for the cruise sedan. For some reason, the EPA score for the hatchback is two miles per gallon lower than the sedan, supposedly due primarily to aerodynamics. However, in real world driving, it appears that the cruise sedan and the cruise hatchback are essentially the same. The high fuel economy is due to a combination of factors, but the turbocharged small displacement engine obviously plays into this, as well as the very efficient six-speed automatic transmission. We also have a standard auto start-stop system, which helps improve city fuel economy. Obviously, unlike a hybrid, the air conditioning is not going to be running while the engine is stopped when the auto start-stop system is engaged. That means that if you live in a hotter climate than I do, you may see less of a benefit from the start-stop system because it won't be stopping the engine as often. The cruise may not be quite as much fun as a Mazda 3 out on the road or certain versions of the Ford Focus, but when you actually take a look at the numbers, this is a better performing vehicle than the Mazda or the Ford. This accelerates almost a full second faster than the Mazda 3, it stops shorter than the Mazda 3, and it actually holds the road a little bit better than Mazda 3 as well. In addition to that, the cruise gives you excellent fuel economy, a quiet cabin, and a fairly well polished ride for a vehicle in this compact segment. As I said at the beginning of the video, Chevy is going about the cruise hatchback a little bit differently than some of the other companies because there is no basic version of the hatchback. Things start out in the LT trim, which is two trim grades above where the sedan starts. The trim grade difference is the main reason that the sedan starts at $16,975 and the hatchback starts at $21,240. Of course, there is still a premium that you have to pay in order to get the hatchback, so a comparably equipped cruise sedan will be about $1,000 less than the hatchback. That's pretty standard as far as hatchbacks in America goes. Generally, hatchbacks are more expensive, even though there's really not that much more going on in the hatch. When it comes to the feature set, General Motors has been pretty aggressive at putting a lot of standard features in the cruise sedan, and that translates into the hatchback as well. Of course, it doesn't hurt that the hatchback, again, starts in that higher trim level. But all hatchback models will get the standard turbocharged engine. They also get 16-inch alloy wheels, 7-inch infotainment system with Apple CarPlay and Android Auto. That's a huge one for this segment. The model we were testing this week was a Premier trim with a number of the options added to it, and that ended up at around $26,000. If you want all of the options, you'll end up at around $28,000. The main option we did not have in the model we were testing in this video is the optional sun and sound package that includes factory navigation with a larger 8-inch color touchscreen infotainment system that's also running the latest version of General Motors navigation software that we find and a few other cars out there. It's a little bit different than what we were looking at in this video. It also has a color LCD between the speedometer and the tachometer, and of course a power sliding moonroof. 
In my personal opinion, unless you really need the moonroof, I would skip that $2,000 package because the addition of CarPlay and Android Auto in all the models of the Cruise effectively means you have factory navigation there as long as you have a smartphone. One thing that I should mention before we move on is that the top-end Premier trim that we were driving does have a slightly different rear suspension than the other versions of the Cruise. General Motors adds a different link to the rear, they call it a Z-Link, and that does help improve the suspension geometry in the back. It improves handling and it improves feel out on the road. Of course, the wide tires that we had on our model likely have a bigger effect in the overall handling ability than that additional link in the rear suspension. Now let's move on to the pros and cons. On the pros side, we have that comfortable ride that I mentioned earlier. The Cruise has one of the longest wheelbases in this segment, and that certainly is noticeable, especially if you're driving out on washboard pavement. In addition to that, the suspension in the Cruise seems to overall be designed with a more comfortable mission in mind. We have that standard turbocharged engine, which is also something we see in the Honda Civic, but quite different than we see in entries like the Corolla IM or the Ford Focus or even the Mazda 3. Thanks to that standard turbocharged engine, performance is notably improved versus the naturally aspirated engine that we see in the Ford Focus, and fuel economy is quite good. The 35 to 36 miles per gallon that we were averaging during our week with the Cruise definitely puts this towards the top of the pack in terms of overall fuel efficiency, even though in terms of overall performance, it also ends up towards the top of the pack. Although Chevy isn't offering the Cruze in the two base trims, it is still a very good deal in this segment. This is about value, not necessarily low MSRP. Because the MSRP is sort of a con for the Cruze, but value ends up being a pro. Although it's not as inexpensive as something like a Corolla IM, you will find much more feature content in the Cruze than in that Corolla. Lastly, on the pro side, we have that optional diesel engine. If you add that optional diesel coming later in 2017, you will get some of the best fuel economy out of a non-hybrid vehicle in America. And of course, if you were a fan of European hatchbacks with diesel engines, the Cruise hatchback really is your only option in America now that Volkswagen has gotten out of the diesel business. Now let's move to the competition. The first and most obvious competitor is the Ford Focus hatchback. The Focus hatchback has been available in the United States for some time, and it's starting to show its age. The cabin in the Focus is notably louder out on the road. It's also slower because we don't have the turbocharged engines in the mainstream models. Of course, Ford has several flavors of high-performance Focus, but we're not talking about those because the Cruise hatchback with its 1.4 liter turbocharged engine doesn't compete with the Focus ST or the Focus RS. It really is aimed directly at the Focus SEL and the Focus Titanium. Ford offers less expensive versions of the Ford Focus, but by the time you comparably equip the Focus to the Cruze, they're going to be about the same price. For that same price, the Ford Focus gives you lower fuel economy, and we have lower performance thanks to its naturally aspirated engine. Personally, I'm a fan of dual-clutch transmissions, so the one that we find in the Ford Focus really doesn't bother me at all, but if you don't like the way they drive, that could be a problem for you, so I'm definitely putting it up here on the chart. The dual-clutch transmission in the Ford is snappy, and it also improves fuel economy in that particular model, but again, it's not going to be as efficient as the Cruze, and it's not going to be as smooth as the traditional automatic we find in the Chevy. Actual road holding in the Ford Focus falls behind the Cruze, but it does come back with better finesse. The overall feel of the Ford Focus out on the road is more engaging than the Cruze, even though it doesn't actually grip the pavement any better. Next up, we have the Corolla IM, formerly known as the Scion IM. Think of the Corolla IM as the ritzy European cousin to the American market Corolla. It has a more premium interior, it has a much fancier rear suspension system, and overall it handles more like a European vehicle. On the downside, it still gets the same 1.8 liter four-cylinder engine that we find in the American market Corolla, meaning that it is quite slow for this segment. Based on our numbers, the Corolla IM handles better than the Cruze, but it's not going to be any faster around a track or around your favorite winding mountain road because it is considerably slower. It also uses a continuously variable transmission, which is not going to be as much fun to drive as the manual transmission or as the traditional automatic that we find in the Chevy. Although fuel economy is excellent in the Corolla IM, the Cruze meets it or beats it, and it's much more fun to drive. The big selling point for the Corolla IM is value. Thanks to its roots as a Scion in the United States, it really has only two options, whether you want the automatic transmission or the manual transmission, and whether or not you want the factory navigation system. Even if you went crazy with the Corolla and added both of its available options, it is going to be significantly less expensive than the Cruze. Of course, you won't find the same kind of options that we have in the Cruze. You won't find Apple CarPlay or Android Auto, you won't find leather seats, power seats, adjustable lumbar support, etc. 
Next up, we have the Honda Civic hatchback. In terms of overall styling, Honda decided to give that Civic hatchback really more of a liftback profile. That ends up making the Civic hatchback one of the longer entries in this segment, although we still don't find the same kind of room back there that we would find in a station wagon of the same length, because the rear end is just not as square. Although the Cruze is one of the larger compact vehicles in America, the Civic ends up feeling a little bit more spacious, a little bit larger inside when we're looking at the hatchback versions. It's really noticeable in the back seat where we have more usable real-world legroom than we find in the Cruze. Like the Cruze, the Civic hatchback is available only with turbocharged engines. You'll find a 1.5 liter turbo under the non-performance versions of the Civic. And that would be not the Civic SI, not the Civic Type R, we're just talking about the mainline turbocharged Civic models here. That 1.5 liter turbo has been tuned up to produce more power than we find in the Cruze, although fuel economy does suffer a little bit as a result. The Civic overall has a more premium feel to it, it feels a little bit more in tune with the driver, and it definitely handles better than the Cruze, especially if you start looking at the Sport and Sport Touring versions of the Civic. On the downside, it does have a continuously variable transmission. So unless you select the manual transmission on your Honda Civic, it's going to be less engaging to drive as far as the transmission goes than some of the other options in this segment. The other downside for the Civic is that you'll definitely pay for the extra refinement because it's going to sell much closer to its MSRP and comparably equipped the MSRP is higher than we find on the Cruze. That said, I personally think the Sport and Sport Touring versions of the Honda Civic are worth every penny. They're definite top picks in the segment. Next up we have the Volkswagen Golf, which also features a standard turbocharged engine. The standard engine we find in the Golf produces more power than we find in the Cruze at 170 horsepower. That makes the Golf notably quicker than the Cruze. It also makes the Golf notably quicker than the average compact hatchback. Although the Golf has become a little bit more grown up over the years, its responses have become a little bit more muted, and of course we get electric power steering so there's less feel coming out of the front of the vehicle, it is still one of the sportier and best feeling entries in this segment. The Golf also has a very solid Germanic feel to it. Everything feels very substantial inside the cabin. Nothing really feels cheap. Volkswagen has also finally put a new infotainment system into the Golf that now gives us Apple CarPlay and Android Auto ability. On the flip side, the Golf ends up being more expensive than the Cruze if you comparably equip it, and repairing your Golf can get fairly expensive. My bottom line in the compact hatchback segment is that the Honda Civic is still my top pick if you can spend the extra money. Again, the Civic is not going to be the cheapest entry in the segment, but it is one of my favorites. The Corolla IM is still my top value pick in this segment. As far as features for the dollar, you really can't go wrong with the Corolla. But the Cruze is an excellent value in this segment. It also has excellent fuel economy and exceptional handling. It's not quite as much fun as a Mazda 3 out on the road, but it does feel a little bit fresher. We get Apple CarPlay and Android Auto, and we get better performance than you'll find in the Mazda 3. Unquestionably, you'll find better performance in the Cruze than we find in the Ford Focus hatchback as well. And lastly, the upcoming 1.6 liter turbo diesel engine for the Cruze is a very tasty option worth putting on your shopping list. If you're looking for high fuel economy without a hybrid system, that's going to be one of the best options in the United States. Expect that model to easily get 45 plus miles per gallon out on the highway without a hybrid system. Thanks for taking the time to check out this video. Again, I'm Alex Dykes. Go ahead and find us over at facebook.com slash alexnautos. And if you want to support this channel, head over to patreon.com and find us over there. I'll see you next week.